Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. Well, what a wonderful lecture the, the sixth chapter of this great book of Revelation allows us to create that mix, an actual layover with Mark 13, where Jesus, when he was in, there in person, taught the seven seals straight on didn't need an interpreter. I mean, he laid it out whereby anyone can understand it. Now, we had gone through the fifth seal. We're going to pick it up today and discuss the sixth seal. And um, as, you, as you've heard me teach many times, the Antichrist comes in the sixth seal. That's when Satan uh, does appear. Why, Michael throws him out of, of heaven. When we get to chapter 12, this will be laid out for you in, in um, an exact layout whereby you can better understand. But how precious it is that Jesus taught whereby there's no mystery in his word. And even as we learned in the last lecture, uh, along about verse 22 and 20, 23 to be exact, he said, hey, I foretold you all things. And he has. The question is, have you read it? That's what's important. So today, let's um, get back into the seals and finish them. Then we're going to get into the seventh chapter, which I like to call a parenthetical chapter because it explains what you're supposed to do with the seals after you have them up here. That's to say, after you have the knowledge in your forehead, what you're supposed to do with that. Okay, so we'll pick up where we left off. We'll go to the sixth chapter of Revelation. We'll pick it up with verse 12 to understand the sixth seal. And here we go with it, with that word of wisdom from our Father, verse 12, chapter 6, the great book of Revelation, and it reads, And I, I, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. You'll understand in the ninth chapter what comes out of the pit when this one appears. You, you would think it was the return of Jesus Christ, but it's not. It's that first white horse we learned of in the first seal. That's why it's, it is so pertinent that you remember that first seal and no overriding. That's what is very most important uh, to not be deceived by God's election. Verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And it is Almighty God that will shake her. And those untimely figs will come forth as we're going to learn. Uh, we'll go back. Could it be that Christ would... Um, let us know of this in, in that Mark 13, the great shaking and something about the fig tree and, and so forth. He's already told us in verse 22, the false Christ is coming. So if they say he's out in the desert or if he's somewhere else, don't you believe it if you're still in a flesh body performing miracles? If the seventh trump hadn't sounded, he's a fake. So let's, let's pick it up, if we may, with the 40, 24th verse of um, Mark chapter 13. And let, let's see if Christ warned us again of the sixth trump. But in those days after that tribulation, that's the first tribulation, the tribulation of that false Christ, that untimely fig cast out, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Um, Verse 25, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Satan's going to be cast out. Michael's making war with Satan and his angels. 
Again, we'll go into much more detail in the, ni the uh, 12th chapter of, of this very thing in verses 6 and 7 of Revelation 12. Heaven is going to be shaken. And, and that war between Michael and, and uh, Lucifer, the old devil, the dragon, he couldn't be cast right out on this earth to deceive you performing those miracles. He's not going to deceive you because you have the seals of God in your forehead. Verse 26. And then, this means after that fact, after you see the false Christ, after you see that trouble and, and see them cast from heaven, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's the seventh trump, the seventh seal. 27, and then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds. Remember the four winds. <clears throat> from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. His elect are very important to him. They were in the first earth age and they are in this one. Why? They proved themselves that they, they have the courage to stand. And, and so it is. The four winds always have to do with a destructive force to the enemy, not to, the, not to God's children, but to the enemies of God, the four winds are always a destructive force, a force of nature. And you want to get accustomed to that because you've got to read nature and the four winds to understand sometimes these very signs whereby you can relate. And, and then, what was this about untimely figs? Verse 28. Now, learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Some, oh, oh, what is summer? That's harvest. That's the harvest time when Almighty God gathers and harvests his elect. And when, when the four winds take care of those that are evil. <clears throat> Did he say, maybe you should learn the parable of the fig tree? No, he said, learn it. And he meant it. Verse 29. So in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. The word it here should be translated he because the subject is Christ and his return at the seventh trump. And uh, when, when you see that fig tree, well, wow, what is this about the fig tree? Well, you, when you learn the parable of the fig tree, this is why Christ would put a, uh, a, a curse, we'll call it, on the fig tree out of season, knowing it wasn't going to put, produce fruit, and it withered and it died. But because he wanted you to learn, what does this mean? And quite frankly, You've got to go all the way back to the beginning. Well, well, brother, what do you mean? Well, let me ask you something. After the seduction in the garden, and after Adam and Eve sinned, what were they wearing when they came forth? Fig leaves. This all happened in the fig garden. This is why even in most any language, the fig leaf stands for that that's hidden. Okay. That's, that's, that's what a fig leaf, basically in any language, in modern times, it means something hidden. Now, as many churches would teach, they had eaten a sour apple. The fig leaves weren't over their mouth. The fig leaves were over their private parts because this is where they had seen it. And Father knew it when he found them. That's where the fig leaf, the parable, begins. If you don't understand that in the beginning, you are never going to understand the end. You cannot under the two churches that Christ taught, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that knew those that claimed to be of our brother Judah and were nothing but Kenites of the synagogue of Satan, that's where they started. Don't, if your church doesn't teach that, if, if you do not know it, you're in a heap of hurt. Because that's the mystery that has been hidden from the very foundation of this earth age and the one that was. 
if you, if, you, if you don't have that, you're never going to understand the rest of it. Also, Christ always makes things very simple. Remember in verse 23, he told us, I, I foretold you all things. Well, where did he foretell us about this fig tree? Jeremiah chapter 24. He showed you two baskets of figs. One of them was terrible. I mean, it was unedible. And the other was ripe and delicious and very, very good. And, and he continues on, and then he lets you know that the parable of the fig tree will transpire when Israel goes back to Jerusalem and forms a nation. And in that nation will be both baskets. There will be good figs and there will be bad figs. Why? Because there will be good figs, which are the children of God, but the bad figs are the tares, which is to say the synagogue of Satan. And that happened in the year of our Lord, 1948. Unfortunately, when Israel became that nation, there was also hangers-on, <clears throat> and the bad fig transpired. That's why he wants you to know and to understand and why 1948 began the final generation of this earth age, because that nation had not been formed as Jeremiah 24 so stipulates for the foundation of this fig tree. You see, you don't plant. You need to know when God uses um, a, a, a thing such as a fig tree, you need to know a little bit about the horticulture of it. Well, how do you plant a fig tree? You, you take a shoot. You don't plant a seed. You take a shoot and set it out. That shoot was set out in the year of our Lord, 1948. So, uh, naturally, that little time has gotten on that. And therefore, again, that's why it is so ever important that you should learn the parable of the fig tree. Uh, and well, why does it really become important? Well, let's go on with the next verse. Verse um, 30. Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. That generation of the fig tree will not pass until all Scripture is fulfilled up to that first day of the millennium comes to pass. You're in it, my friend. Like it or lump it, you're there. Verse 31 to complete. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. God's word is always sure and true. It never changes. As it was in the beginning, so it is now, and so it shall be forever. That's why you never waste time studying the Word of God. So there you have all seven of those seals given in Mark 13. Only it's laid out whereby a child can understand the events that transpire. So now let's return to chapter 6, the great book of Revelations. Let's pick it up in verse 14. And let's understand what happens then. Verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Great shaking. There's one rock that can't be shaken if you're standing on it, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains, and the mighty men, your political figures, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Well, why did they? were afraid. 16, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? You can. You can stand proudly as one of God's elect. Well, why, why would they pray for death rather than facing Christ? Well, it's, many of them were good Christian people, untaught from the word of God, worshiped the fallen one, and realized Instead of worshiping Almighty God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, they were Satan worshipers in ignorance, thinking this false one. This is why you've got to know 
This is why Jesus said back in Mark 13 to start with in verse 5, let no man deceive you because many will come claiming to be Christian, but they'll still be deceived. What? To only two out of seven churches were pleasing to God, and your answer therein lies as to who you should follow that teaches the truth, the word of God concerning the, very, the tares, the Kenites, and Satan himself from the very beginning. Explaining to you the confusion. Why, well, we, we read of the morning star. We have a morning star. Well, yes, that's Jesus Christ. But then there's another morning star, and that's Lucifer. Lucifer means bright morning star. And, and then you have the Christ, but you have the Antichrist. That's instead of Christ. And, and, and uh, you have, um, if you would, the Savior, and then you've got Ratchet Jaw that claims he will save you, and he's a fraud. But most of all, God sent you the Word, foretold you all things. And as much as he created you for his pleasure, have you read his Word? Have you read it with understanding? Because that's what prevents you from being deceived. Now, what do we do with these seven seals? Well, he's not going to leave you wanting. He's going to tell you. That's, what, uh, that's why I like to call chapter 7 a, a parenthetical chapter. It's in parentheses to kind of tell you what that's about. So without further ado, chapter 7, verse 1, let's go with it. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And again, these, these four angels are angels of nature. You want to watch them. That's what they utilize. These four winds, when they come from every direction, they destroy. And that brings about the end. You, this makes a very interesting study because also in the seventh chapter of Daniel, you can read of those four winds. And what God's promise is that those four winds in Daniel chapter 7, they won't blow until it's time for a cleansing of the temple for the true Christ. And also in, in Ezekiel chapter 37 concerning teaching the dry bones, people ignorant of God's word and prophesying and teaching the real truth to them, bone comes on to bone, and people begin to hear the truth. The seals of God become appearing in their foreheads, and they begin to gain knowledge. And the four winds are standing by, even in the book of Ezekiel, to bring the end at the seventh trump. So that's what you have here. They're ready to blow. But what happens? And, and within this is your answer, verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, all seven of them. That's the teaching and the truth that should be in your forehead. And he cried with a loud voice. He didn't whisper. He didn't speak gently. He loudly proclaimed to be to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth with, and the sea. Um, the, he was um, coming to stop them for a moment. What was he saying? Verse 3 saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till or until, until what? Until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Not on their foreheads with some tattoo as some idiots would have you believe. But in, what's in your forehead, your brain, to understand the simplicity of the teachings of Christ, to absorb it in your mind, whereby you cannot be deceived. God will not let the end come until those seals are taught and received by those that should receive them. You know, I can remember many years ago it was very difficult to explain those seals because you had no way, but now with modern technology, where we broadcast all the way around the world with, to, to very large audiences, then those seals can be taught 
and absorbed. And we see God's word as it grows, as it expands. And that in itself lets us know that the parable of the fig tree is certainly of the truth. And the end cannot come until the seals in God's elect have been planted. The moment that happens, those four winds will be released. Let that be a sound doctrine in your mind. Verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now some people would say, Well, now there you got it, brother. That's all that's going to heaven. That's not the subject, nor is it at the article. The, the, the subject is not going to heaven. The subject is training and explaining those seven seals that we just read of and implanting them in the minds of those that are supposed to hear God's elect. Okay. Verse 5, let's understand. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000, he being the old elder. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Aser, which this, this, this would be Asher in the Hebrew, this is Greek, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephilim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh was sealed 12,000. Verse 7, of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Levi, the priest line, were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Ishakar were sealed 12,000. Verse 8, of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph, uh-oh, what happened here? It's supposed to be Dan. Dan's left out. Joseph were sealed 12,000, and the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000, and it would seem that Ephraim and Dan got lost by the wayside. You with Companion Bibles, you're very fortunate, uh, uh, and uh, you will find that, um, that idolatry caused them to miss. They weren't taught properly, but the beauty is that when we read the 48th chapter of Ezekiel, in the millennium on the Lord's day, they're back in. So on repentance, God is a forgiver, and that documents that the day of the Lord is a great day. Verse 9 to continue. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude. You want to know how many people are in heaven right now? Not 144,000. They've got work to do as God's witnesses. Right here, a great multitude which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and psalms in their hands. All men, they, palms rather, in their hand. They were ready. Verse 10, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. They're praising God. Well, I, I thought they were out here at a hole in the ground, according to what our preacher said. Well, your preacher lied to you. He's not a student of God's Word, because God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And um, there have been so many people that have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. This means after the crucifixion, and even when he went to the captives, as it is written, all the way back to the time of Noah, many of them have washed their robes in belief and understanding. 11, and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell down before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Oh, how pleasing that was to him and is to him. 12, saying, what are they saying? Amen. Blessings, one, and glory, two, and uh, wisdom. Notice the polysendent, the and, wisdom, one, two, three, and thanksgiving, four, and honor, five, and power, six, and might, seven. God's spirits, be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. How happy they were. 
and how pleasing it was that they would serve God in this manner. Precious. How simple the teachings of God's Word. If you just open the buds of your mind, pray about it, and receive that truth into your forehead. The deception of the end times, it's here. It's upon the earth. The confusion is easily understood if you understand the seals in your forehead. 13, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? What are all these people doing up here in heaven with white robes, and how did they get here? You want to know? Then don't ever let some clown tell you there's only 144,000 that are going to make it, and they get out and scrape and scrumble and pray and fear that somebody's going to outdo them. That isn't required. All you got to do is love him follow him. And there are 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 more, 144,000 times souls, children that have overcome and are in heaven. God is putting together some people to teach those seals. That's the 144,000. Unfortunately, even they go astray as we'll find out in the chapter 14 for a short period. 14, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, <clears throat> excuse me, and he said to me, you want to know who they are? This is the people that are in heaven. Listen carefully. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And actually, this hap transpired after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they're there. You can't even number them. There's no number to it. How precious our Father is that he gives us the victory, that he gives us the rewards, that the washing is there. Listen, we live in perilous times. And yet at the same time, it's a very simple time. You could understand the turmoil in the world because if you noticed anything about the teachings in Mark 13, there's not just one tribulation. There are two tribulations. The tribulation of the Antichrist and then the tribulation of the true Christ. The tribulation of the Antichrist, you're going to have, you could have to be uh, called on to be a witness in that time, and it could be a little bit of trouble. But it's no trouble for one of God's own. Why? Because he's with us. He protects us. He gives us knowledge. And once you have his truth in your forehead, there is no way that Satan or anyone else can deceive you. You know the truth, and nobody, but nobody, is going to pull you away from the Word of God with ratchet jaw stuff, traditions of men, things that make void the Word of God when you have the real thing, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, to know that heaven is filled with people that love the Lord Jesus Christ, that have followed Him, that have believed Him, that love him. How precious it is that uh, those robes are washed. Uh, and that's who they are. Simply followers of truth. Verse 15, to continue. Therefore are they before the throne of God, not in some hole in the ground, right now, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he, he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. That, that dwell among them, if God dwells among you, that's Shekinah glory. That's the, that's the translation of Shekinah glory. 16, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. When he puts this earth back in its rightful place, but at the same time, 
when you're in a spiritual body, what would burn you now will not phase you then. If you understand what I'm saying, and I'll, I'll kind of leave it there because it's kind of self-explanatory. Let's complete the chapter 17. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water that run right out from under that throne when you read the great book of Ezekiel. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There's nothing there to be sad about. What a glorious, wonderful time that a tear need not be shed. This is after the lake of fire has dissipated and, and that those are blotted out where they never even bother your memory anymore. All those that overcome joyfully and rejoicing that, well, uh, how, what do you have to do to make it? Wash your robes in the blood of the Lamb. Believe upon Him that He died for you. That when you repent, he washes your sins away. They are forgiven. It's that simple. But how simple even the depths of the scriptures are because God is not the author of Babel, or that's to say confusion, but he's the author of peace. No tears, no sadness. When you follow him ultimately and knowing we may have a little trouble in the first tribulation, but we can cut it. Why? Because he's with us. The second tribulation, we are the champions. You don't have to worry about it. Christ is not angry at you. But the wrath of God will go against the enemy. What a time to live right now to see and to understand this word of God, the seals in your forehead. And let me tell you something. When those that are supposed to receive these seals, those four winds will be turned loose. And with those four winds, they're angels of nature, the environment. And quite frankly, uh, these boys that like to teach global warning, they need to learn, first of all, scientifically, spiritually, and in actuality, about these angels of the environment. Because he who created the environment knows how to put it whereby that sun won't bother you, the warmth won't bother you, the cold won't bother you. And as we read in Romans chapter 8, even the creation itself groans at this time, shudders and shakes for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ so that this wonderful earth is put back in its original form. Boy, that's going to be a wonderful time. I hope you're there. Because only those that are not there will be those that go into the lake. One would have to be pretty obstinate to turn on he that provides all things. He that paid the price for you simply to follow him and believe on him and be a resident in this wonderful world when he returns. The choice is yours. He foretold you all things. Have you read it? Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. 
Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you've got a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We do not judge people. We don't need to. God is judge. He's keeping real good score on everyone and everything. Something we couldn't do. We always mess stuff up like that. But he's got an accurate record in the book of life, and he keeps good score. You don't have to worry about judging people. You just be able to discern who you fellowship with, and let that be as it is. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need the address, you don't need that phone number. Why? Well, God knows what you're thinking right now. Do you know something? He's got time for you. He hears your prayers. They're even bottled, as we learn in, in these first chapters of the great book of Revelation. And he, he does love you. He may not love what you're doing, but he sure loves you. Return that love and be blessed. Won't you do that? Now, let's go to his throne. Heavenly Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and uh, we've got Felix from Haiti. I would like to know how the humans created on the sixth day became sinners. I understand Adam and Eve listened to the serpent and... Um, and uh, disobeyed God and became the first humans fallen in sin. Well, I, I, you know, you're assuming quite a lot there. People just look at them today. People don't need Satan or anyone else to sin. It is just human nature that some people sin. And even when the six-day creation was there, Satan was on earth. Okay. He, he was there. And, um, and very subtle, as it is written. And um, thank God and Jesus, uh, our Redeemer, for that, and the Lord continue to use you and your staff as a bright light to those you want. And hello, kind of stuck together here. To receive light. Uh, pray for Haiti. Our, my people need Jesus and repentance. Well, you've certainly had your part of it there in Haiti, and we'll certainly be doing that, okay? Uh, Charlie from uh, the Dominican Republic. What was the point behind the story of Lot and his two daughters? Well, it was that when God gets ready to destroy something, if there is one righteous man in his family... He's going to pull them out and deliver them. That's what is behind the story, that God is able. And it was Moses' prayer of compassion for a just man that caused God if it, or reprompted him to give life to those that were righteous. Clara from Georgia, is Satan the father of Cain? Well, let God word answer that for you in John chapter 8 St. John chapter 8 verse 44 where Jesus said I, I know that you are of father Abraham why because Abraham means father of all nations spiritually speaking but he said you you Abraham would hear you don't 
Me, your father was the first murderer. Whoa, now who was that? Well, it was Cain, of course. And the deeds of your father you will do, your father is the devil. Now, that's Christ's teachings. Well, I just, and there'll be some will say, well, I just can't hardly believe that. Then you don't believe God's word and you're hell bound. That's the way it is. You would never be in a church that would recognize who those claim to, that claim to be our brother Judah and in fact are of the synagogue of Satan because you won't listen to the teachings of Christ. That's what Christ taught. I believe it with all my heart. Why? Because he said it. And you know, there's many proofs of that if you're wise enough to keep score and observe uh, spiritually discerning. Mike from South Dakota, in Mark 13:30, how do we know that 1948 was the start of the last generation? I, I think I answered that pretty well in today's lecture, all right, through the parable of the fig tree. And uh, the reason we know it was 1948 is that's when Israel was formed in the year of our Lord, 1948. If I remember right, May the, what, 50, somewhere in there. Uh, Blanca from California. If a church does healing and always ask for money in the beginning, middle, and in the end, is that okay? Can Satan work through people at churches to do healings to attract people? <laughs> people, you know, in the first place, churches don't heal people. Preachers don't heal people. Jesus Christ heals people. The Holy Spirit, that's the Spirit of God and Christ, they heal heal people. You cannot buy healing, and you cannot order healing. You can only anoint with the oil of our people, as James 5 demands, and ask Christ to do the healing. Now, we have a lot of people that can use psychology, plan a few um, hydro... Uh, I, I, I'm not, I'm going to sound like I'm judging if I go any further with this, but, you know, God doesn't, I'll, I'll just end it by saying God doesn't send out beggars. And when you go out, do not take a begging bag. So, beginning and the middle and the end is, I call begging, and I'm not, I'm just discerning, I'm not judging. Uh, what everybody does is their own business, but they answer for it. Susie from Colorado. I spent my entire life looking for a teacher, and I finally found one in you. Thank you. I'm 75 years old, and I really appreciate you. Well, God bless you. We appreciate you being here with us, all right? You're, we're, we're home. We're family. Welcome aboard. It's good to have you. Gene from Ohio. Where can I find Memzar in the Bible? Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 2. Uh, the word begins with B, okay? But take your Strong's Concordance and check out the word in the Hebrew, 4464, okay? It's, it, is, um, it is someone that has countered uh, God's plan. That's what the word, word Memzar means. I, I, want, I do want to say something. Deuteronomy... 23.2 says that a mamzar cannot participate in the kingdom of heaven. It means the kingship of heaven. Why? Because they have their own kings, if they believe. Don't ever tell a mamzar they can't go to heaven. You'd be lying to them. I, I know of one very sad situation that happened not very far from where I'm sitting right now, where a so-called preacher told a mamzar that he was doomed for hell and the person uh, drove their pickup off of a cliff, killed themselves. Uh, that false teaching can do many dangerous things. So uh, that's why I uh, say <clears throat> it does not mean they can't go to heaven, but take part in the kingship of heaven, but they have their own kingship, all they can handle, and God loves them. So you... you it, you can't blame a child for what parents did. Rich from Minnesota, Simplify, did the first Earth Age end at the Catabo? And Simplify right back, yes, it did. That's when 
That was the uh, final performance. God taking his wrath on the generation of that time. Lucy from Kentucky. Question. Explain or elaborate the names that are written in the book of life. Some think only some names will be written there. I think all will be written. Straighten us out on this. Naturally, it is the life because if you're living, you're in it. Okay. And, and it is your record. It, it has all the things that you have done, both good and bad. And many righteous acts cover a multitude of sins. And once you repent for a sin, it's erased. It's not there. And this is why God said, I don't want to hear about it again. Once I forgive it and erase it, don't, don't, don't it's all right for you to remember what happened so you don't do it again. But don't ask me for forgiveness a second time for the same sin I've already forgiven. That's an insult to God. Okay. So, and that's the way he feels about it. But the book, when it's open, it's reward, reward and, and gifts for those that have good deeds. And it could be even a hell-bent trip for those that have done too many bad deeds. That's the great white throne judgment is judged from that book. Diane from Massachusetts. When we die, we are absent from this body and present with the Lord. How then are we judged at the great white throne judgment if we are already with the Lord? I'm confused. Because the, you've got to stay chronologically according to God's plan. God says, I'm not going to judge until after the day of the Lord, because there's a lot of people that never had an opportunity to learn the truth. It is always fair. Uh, there, as it is written in Romans, there are some in the flesh that God even sent the spirit of stupor upon, slumber, where they can't learn. They can't see the truth for some reason, probably for their own protection, so they would have an opportunity to learn in the millennium. But um, uh, that's, that's what the great white throne judgment does not take place until after the thousand year reign where everyone has an opportunity to correct and to know the truth. Well, and, and there'll be many who'll say, well, he's teaching a second chance. No. With what's being taught in this world today, there are very few people that even have a chance. How, how sad it is when, when that happens. And when, when the simplicity is that all you got to do is love him and let him know you love him and not be deceived by the false one who's coming very soon. Um, Brennan, and Brennan is from Arizona. My name is Brennan. I'm 12 years old. I live in Arizona. My question for you is if God knows everything, then why did he give free will? Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's really, Brennan, it's, that's a good question. Why would God give free will if he knows everything? Because God loves and created his children for his pleasure. The last verse of Hebrews, cha of uh, Revelation chapter 4. And he wants that love returned. And only can someone with free will, an entity, can love develop in them if they have free will. If God has to force someone to love him, that's not real love. So therefore, he, he must give free will. And those that do love him will overcome. And those that do not, that choose not to, um, he doesn't want them, and they won't be around anymore. That's how he operates. Uh, Joe from Wisconsin, thank you for your uplifting message. You're so welcome. Let me find your qu one question. Friends have asked, are all God's angels male? I said I believe they are, and I hope I'm right. Please give some uh, verification on this. Thanks. Well, let's, let's take, we know that Adam was created in God and the angel's image, male. Okay. And we know then that from him 
the helix curve, I believe, my opinion, that's the DNA, a feminine DNA was taken, and Eve was formed. But a soul still came from heaven and entered Eve. Okay, she, and so therefore, uh, God, male and female, he created them. Now we know that in the third earth ages, which is what we're interested in, Jesus' teachings are that they neither are taken marriage nor are they given in marriage. In the bodies of the third earth age, why? Because they are as the angels. There are spirit be spiritual bodies and spiritual beings. There will be no birth or anything of that nature because the souls that are, that's complete. That's all there will be. Uh, Charles from Virginia, Pastor Murray, I'd like to ask a question. The people were there on two sides of the gulf. We're talking about paradise here, okay? Can they take talk to each other one side or the other? No, not at this time. Not until the Lord's day comes. Then what happens? Read, read Luke chapter 16, and you'll get what's happening there right now. But, but then when the Lord's Day comes, in Ezekiel chapter 44, verses uh, beginning along about verse 20, the Zadok, if someone didn't make it, if they're on the wrong side of paradise, you can go there and talk to them. But that cannot be until the millennium. And you would have to be one of God's elect to even be able to do that. Otherwise, we teach all of them. That's, that's not an unfair thing. It just means that God loves his election enough that if they have a mother, brother, father, sister, unmarried, that is not making it, they can go there and get on their case, give them an attitude adjustment, teach them a little discipline. But then they have to cleanse themselves before they can return back to Christ. He does that because he loves the election. Okay. Ezekiel 44, begin reading with verse 20. The Zadok, or God's elect. It's a Hebrew word that means the just. Anthony from Florida. Today, during my your early morning broadcast, a person wrote in and asked you about being born again. Your answer was, quote, it was a, script, it was a scripture about being born from above, unquote. This confuses me, as Jesus said in John 3.3, 3, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Where does it say born from above? I'm not trying to be picky, but even with my Holy Bible concordance, I cannot find it. I hope you have a strong concordance. That's for the strong. I hope you don't have a young's concordance, because that's for the very, very young. Okay. Um, and I hope in your Strong's Concordance that you would go to the Greek dictionary after you looked at the word again and would know that it was the word 509, 509 in the Greek Concordance Dictionary. And it would tell you that the word translated again is from above. Okay. And, you know, you don't have to be... Um, too sharp to know God said, from heaven, let us create man in our image on earth. So, well, where did I come from then? From above. Okay. It is necessary. Nicodemus was talking to him, and he said, you mean I got to be reborn through the womb? And he said, every man must be born of the water. That's not baptism, that's the bag of water. Every entity must be born of woman, innocent as a babe, to make his or her mind up whether they will love God or Satan. But naturally, the souls are from above. And 509, Greek dictionary, you got it. That's where it comes from. The King James is a wonderful translation. But it was not written until 1611. A student of God's Word, let me rephrase that, a scholar of God's Word depends on the original manuscripts 
or a set of manuscripts in the original language to understand a deeper truth when a problem such as that transpires, comes up. That's not a biggie. The King James people, you know, we have copies of the original King James and we carry them not as a study tool, but simply so that you have the letter that the translators wrote to the readers. And they make it very clear, the King James uh, translators, they say, you need to check us out. We've done our best. And check us out in the languages. Uh, so naturally a scholar does that. Greg from California, just a curiosity question. Is your best, in your best estimate, will those that make it past the great judgment do those do those things that they love to do in flesh bodies such as golf, um, bird watch, or hike, and so forth? Or do we basically do only spiritual things and render most of our time to God? God's very natural. We do natural things, the things you enjoy doing. Uh, immensely so, okay? E exploration would be a beautiful thing, wouldn't it? especially when this earth is put back in its original form. And you can go to the North Pole or the South Pole, and you won't find any ice because the firmament will have been put back in place. And you can travel anywhere. We don't have to use fossil fuel in spiritual bodies, but that, that God had propulsion that he has is fantastic. What a time. It's going to be wonderful. Ed from Florida. In conversation with a friend about the dead people, he said when Jesus ascended to heaven, he took all his with him, and unbelievers stayed on the other side of the gulf. So are the dead unbelieving on one side and believers on the other? Are, are um, believers with God? Believers are with God, and certainly, um, uh, and so it is, and there is the other, Luke 16, I'm out of time, love you, God loves you because you enjoy studying the word. Brought to you by your tithes and offerings, if we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, he will always bless you. Most important though, you listen to me, you stay in his word. Every day in his word, it's a good day, even with trouble, you know why? because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How, was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand 
the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, Book of Deuteronomy. A repeat of the law by Moses, the fifth book in the Pentateuch, giving us the law basically in layman terms where anyone can understand. We're up at the head of the Dead Sea, that's to say the north end. We're on the east side of Jordan, uh, very near Mount Nebo. And we're about to cross the Jordan. As a matter of fact, uh, the ninth chapter opened.